As always, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to you. If you would, be turning over to the book of Revelation. I would like for us to study various passages in this book this morning. Probably something we typically don't think of coming from the book of Revelation, but nonetheless, here we go. If I were to mention the word beatitude, where would your mind normally go? I dare say it'd probably go to Matthew chapter 5, to the Sermon on the Mount, or maybe even the book of Luke, his gospel account. Maybe even the book of Psalms. And while each of these certainly have what we would call beatitudes, we'll be considering them, or these beatitudes, from the book of Revelation this morning. Now, one, a couple quick notes on this word, beatitude. It's not found in the Bible. This word is not used. However, it does adequately describe biblical concepts. This is similar to such things as the Great Commission or even the Golden Rule. These terms are not specifically used, however, they describe different aspects of the gospel or different actions in which we as Christians must engage in. Now the word itself, beatitude, means a state of great joy or supreme blessedness, which brings our second term. Blessed. This term comes from the Greek word makarios, which means supremely blessed, by extension, fortunate, to be well off or to be happy. Blessed or makarios appears seven times within the book of Revelation, and those verses are chapter 1, verse 3. Chapter 14, verse 13. Chapter 16, verse 15. Chapter 19, verse 9. Chapter 20, verse 6. Chapter 22, verse 7. And chapter 22, verse 14. Now we must realize that the book of Revelation was written to warn of coming events to the people of its time. However, there are principles in which we can glean to help us or aid us in our Christian walk. After all, each of these things were shown to the servants of Christ and thus are useful to all children of God throughout all ages. Our first beatitude, taken from Revelation chapter 1 verse 3. I would like to begin reading in verse 1 of that chapter. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel, or by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So we have our first beatitude. Blessed is he that reads, and those that hear. Throughout the lesson, I would like to break each of these down to study the phrases. So this is how we'll do it. Blessed is he that reads, and those that hear. This seems to refer to the custom of the first century, and no doubt others, where one would read publicly before an audience which would be listening to the message. This would have been a common occurrence at this time. Now this portion refers to a specific prophecy that was given to them. This message was designed for a specific group, and while we may not understand the message to them, they certainly would have. 
Thus, they would become recipients of this specific blessing. Furthermore, though this account is specific to the original readers, some principles are clear to us and would obviously apply and would further aid us as Christians. Now we must note that this does not exclude private, personal reading, individual reading. After all, we are expected to be diligent students of the word. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. This should be a very private and individual matter. But those who present God's word are held in high esteem. Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. You see, the effect of sound preaching is also seen here. It shows the way of salvation to the hearers. There is obviously a clear benefit to reading God's word. Doing so brings about the individual's faith. Romans chapter 10 verse 17. First and foremost. Continuing with verse 3 of Romans 1, or Revelation 1. Blessed is he that keeps those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. To keep something, specifically with this verse, and those similar to it, to keep something what it, that is written is to be mindful of the message that it contains. In this instance, they would need to heed the warnings for future events. This is especially true due to what would occur in their future. Now, differing, I guess it depends on who you ask as far as commentators, but the timeline would be different who you're asking. Some say that this is working toward AD 70 and the destruction of Israel. Others feel very strongly that it's after that event. Either way, there would be an event that these Christians needed to be prepared for. Given the nature of John's visions here, the expression at hand could not refer to a quick completion of these future events. All of them would not be occurring in a very fast manner. However, this phrase, in light of the context, must refer to a uh, completion of these events over a period of time. And the shortly that's used here refers to the fact that these events would begin in their near future. These events would start taking place shortly. Essentially, John is saying, you need to know this because it's going to benefit you as Christians. It's going to help you be better off. You'll be prepared. They were expected to, to heed such a discourse just as Christians were in prior times. We see in Matthew chapter 24 where Jesus is warning his audience of the impending doom, specifically of the temple, Jerusalem at large. He gave signs when this certain event would occur. Rome would eventually lay waste to Jerusalem, and those who heeded the warnings of Christ were prepared and even spared because they were able to follow those warnings. As the blessing presents, those who keep the sayings, they were prepared and they were blessed and they were spared from the wrath of Rome. Christians today must have this same attitude. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 16 reads, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, 
having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself, and unto the doctrine continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. There's quite a few different principles in here that would benefit us as Christians. But summarizing them, we're expected, we are called to be obedient even throughout receiving persecution, tribulation. People will attack us, whether verbally or physically, we need to be prepared for that. Just as our first century brethren to whom the book of Revelation was given. We must prioritize being godly over physical characteristics. While we're not saying there's nothing wrong with cycling for good health or lifting weights, the priority must be godly things, following God first. And we must give attention to growing by reading exhortation and doctrine. Again, that passage was 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 16. Clearly, it is beneficial for one to know and obey God's will. He's promised us that it will benefit us in this life as well as that which is to come. You think of all the different prohibitions we find in the New Testament scriptures and how many of them, if you do engage in them, harm yourself, harm your body, harm your mind. Yet God commands us not to partake in those evil deeds and we're better off for it. Now doing these things brings about one's own salvation. The importance of reading, hearing, and keeping these commandments cannot be stressed enough. Ultimately, those who do so are blessed. And we are ultimately blessed in heaven, but we also see these blessings on earth. More importantly, we will be blessed by inhabit inhabiting heaven. Our second beatitude. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. I would like to read verse 12 as well, where it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. First phrase we wish to consider, first part of verse 13. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Now this particular phrase describes a specific class of people. This group of people is one who dies in the Lord. Not everyone falls into this classification. There are those who die in the Lord, and there are those who die outside the Lord. In order to receive this prescribed blessedness, two things must be true. First, one must come to be in the Lord while living in the flesh. We see in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 16 through 22, that Jesus himself made this possible says, and that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body by the cross. His death made this possible, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace unto you which were far off, and to them that were nigh. 
For though or through him we, ha we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. And of the household of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple of the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. When we obey the gospel by repenting, confessing Christ before others, and being baptized, we are added to this great spiritual household. Acts chapter 2 verse 47. It is the act of baptism that puts one into Christ. Galatians chapter 3 verse 27. At that point, you can correctly state that you are in the Lord. The second thing that must be true, one must remain in the Lord. We are expected to grow and to be strong in the faith, in the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. We are expected as Christians to labor in the Lord. Romans chapter 16, verse 12. We are expected... To boldly teach in the Lord. To boldly speak. Acts chapter 14 verse 3. Now these are just a few component parts of being faithful. We're not going to limit that list to these, but these are certainly included. But we are to be active, to be growing in the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17, as well as chapter 15 verse 58. Then we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 22 through 24, where Paul pens, For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. Likewise, also, he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. So we are expected to remain faithful to him throughout our days on the earth. If we ever fall astray and remain astray, we are not remaining in the Lord. We are not abiding with God. Thus, we will not be recipients of this blessed promise. So one remains faithful by abiding with God in this physical life. Then upon our physical death, we become recipients of of this great blessedness that is dying in the Lord. Now we consider the second part of verse 13. That they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Certainly this would be a great comfort to those of the first century. These brethren were after all enduring great persecution. By being faithful, they would have been subjected to various trials and tribulations, verbal abuse, physical abuse, simply for doing what is right. They would be persecuted for preaching sound doctrine, for abstaining from evil, for speaking out against false doctrine, and by being different from the world, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I think of this type of situation like turkeys. We had a turkey farm when I was, I was growing up. And sometimes these birds would develop quicker than others. And if one did that, usually their skin would change colors. It would be a little bit more red, maybe gain a little bit of blue to it. Well, if they were ever different, so different from the rest of the flock, the others would attack it simply for being different. And then whenever a turkey sees blood, they don't stop. They keep going until that bird is dead. It's kind of a disgusting picture, but that's really what the forces of evil wish to do to the Christian. We are different from the world, and by our actions, by the words we use, how we present ourselves, the world will take note. 
And they may not lash out at us. Of course, they certainly could, and they have before. But they certainly will grow a hatred for us because we're different. Ultimately, because we're showing that they're in sin. And hopefully we're working with them to get them out of that sin by converting to the gospel of Christ. Which is often easier said than done. But our obligation still exists. Because of all these different trials, tribulations, persecutions, these brethren no doubt sought rest from their labors. Then it's noted that their deeds would follow them after death. Righteous works remain to affect others on the earth after their death. We see this from the life of Abel. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4. Abel being dead, yet speaketh. His good works remain on the earth to benefit us. We're expected to grow, to learn from his example, as was the many others. Others such as found in Hebrews chapter 11. We would call that the, the hall of fame of faith. There are many good examples there for which we should follow. Their good examples are there for us. Yet this takes that idea further. These good works follow the doer of them into eternity. It is by our deeds that we will be judged. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10. Now don't get in mind that this is a meritorious system where there's a scale of both good and evil deeds. Whenever we do one, say an evil deed, the scale kind of tips in favor of it. Now we've got to do two to tip the scale on the good side. That's not what's being pictured here. There is no tally to keep track of what we do good that's acceptable to God and what we do evil that's contrary to his word. It's not a scale system. However, we are expected to perform works of righteousness, works of faith, works of obedience. James chapter 2 verses 21 through 26. We are able to show our faith to others by the righteous acts that we perform and even by the evil acts that we choose to abstain from. Sometimes the child of God does stumble and sin. However, it is the very blood of Christ that covers these acts of, of sin on our part. 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Looking forward to an end of strife and one's reward when this life is over, both serve as an incentive to bear up under the persecution which we face in this life. This is just one small example of how we are saved by hope. Romans chapter 8 verse 24. Now our third beatitude. Revelation chapter 16 verse 15. It says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth, and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Blessed is he that watcheth. To watch is to be constantly prepared. Mark chapter 14 verse 38 reads, Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. This is not an excuse for us to sin. It is rather a warning of the possibility of us sinning. Thus we need to be vigilant, especially if we expect to be considered blessed as it's used in this passage. We must realize that our adversary, the devil, actively seeks our destruction. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Jesus warns of being unprepared. In Luke chapter 21, verses 34 through 36, where he says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged, that is, burdened, with surfeiting, or the pain of debauchery and drunkenness, and cares of this life, so that that, so that, that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, 
that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Such things would disqualify people from being prepared, engaged in, being engaged in these sins. They too would be caught in a snare. Yet being prepared, as Jesus has outlined, allows them to be accounted worthy. Now this term comes from the Greek word kataxio, which means to deem entirely deserving. That's a marvelous concept to think about. Jesus says if we're prepared, we're faithful to him, he deems us entirely deserving. It also gives us the ability to stand before him. We're promised because of his blood that we can come boldly to the throne of God. We don't have to be whimpering, groveling, though we certainly would be humble. But we have boldness. Based on our preparedness, our faithfulness to God, we can come standing before the Son of Man. We don't have to be ashamed. We must therefore be like the wise virgins of Matthew, virgins of Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. There are ten virgins pictured there, and all of them were expected to wait on the bridegroom while he tarried. Yet we see that five of them took enough oil for their lamps, not only for the journey, but while they waited. Because of this preparedness, they were permitted to join the bridegroom in the marriage. In contrast, we see those five foolish virgins which were not permitted. They were not allowed in. They didn't take enough oil for their journey, so they went back to buy more, and thus were unprepared for his coming. Then we see those who keepeth their garments, lest they walk naked, and others uh, see their shame. The blessedness that is extended to those who keep their garments is found, the concept is here. We must keep our garments. Now, this is clearly a figurative expression. However, it obviously does apply to our dress, how we present ourselves to the world. It is a shameful thing for us to be found naked. So then why do so many Christians participate in such an activity? At least for the time being, this could change next session, who knows, but prostitution is illegal in Texas. Yet some choose to dress the part. Worse yet, we allow our daughters to dress as such. I've seen it many times before. We consider it cute when they're little, a couple years old. Then when they get to be preteens, it's kind of annoying when they dress immodestly. And then we wonder what went wrong when they actually play the part when they get older. Something has gone terribly wrong when that situation exists. When we allow our children to participate in wearing such poor attire. That applies to how we dress for worship. That applies to how we dress before the world, outside of worship. How do we present ourselves? Christians are expected to uphold the doctrine of biblical modesty. Biblical modesty is displayed one way in how we dress. If we're displaying other things, we're doing wrong. As parents, we need to understand this subject matter, that is, true biblical modesty. We need to be the shining example of our children for them to show them what to wear, what not to wear. And we need to teach them to follow us. Then we need to inspect what we expect from them. Unfortunately, we have allowed ourselves not to feel shame in this regard. However, when we engage in such activity, when we practice such immodesty, our Lord is ashamed of us. We find in Exodus chapter 32, verse 35, that the children of Israel were found naked before God. 
They were found naked before their enemies. You see, in this passage, they had just participated in making the golden calf. They offered sacrifices to it. And eventually, many of them rose up to play. And it is highly likely that many of them were probably naked, without clothes. But the figurative aspect is pointed out. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies, their enemies witnessed this act, or these acts of debauchery. And this wickedness not only put them at odds against God, but it also gave occasion for these enemies to speak against God. Because if Israel is allowed to do such a thing, why aren't we? Israel was known by the nations round about them even shortly after fleeing from Egypt. And now they were seen to be actively disobeying Jehovah. We see the, weak, the weakness of King Saul, which ultimately led to the Philistines' challenge by Goliath. However, we see the faith and the strength and the preparedness of David. And he asked the question, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26, it says, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man who killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? You have a little shepherd boy expecting what God expects out of grown men, to put away this reproach from the armies of Israel, from the armies of the living God. His, faith, his faithfulness prompted him to stand up and act. And we see later on in this account that he would vanquish Goliath. We see in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 13 through 14, that Nathan convicted King David of his sin with Bathsheba. Not only did they commit adultery, but it also gave occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme against him. Instead, may we be more like Daniel. In Jan uh, Daniel chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. It says, Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful... Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. You see, Daniel was upright, and these rulers hated him. The only way that they could find fault with Daniel was to fabricate one. They structured laws, they had them put in place in order to snare Daniel. Yet in the end, he was still found faithful to God. Their attempts, though they succeeded initially, only served to further prove God's existence and his faithfulness to his people. Now these are just a few things which we can learn from the Beatitudes of the book of Revelation. Just as those brethren of old would have greatly benefited from these blessings, specifically the blessed that is received, these makarios, these beautiful attitudes as it were, they would be happy. They would be fortunate for obeying these different warnings. We too can be recipients of these blessed attitudes by adhering to the message that they received and gleaning from it those things which can apply to us. We too can expect the same result, the final reward, just as they would have received. These blessings are given to those who read, hear, and keep God's commandments. They are given to those who live and die in the Lord. We have discussed what that means and what is necessary in order to be saved. And if you're not a Christian, why not take the steps this morning to become one? We've also discussed, as a child of God, 
how one can be restored to faithful service to God. And if this applies to you, why not take the steps this morning to have that sin removed from your life and be faithful to God once again? We simply do not know when this world will end and when Jesus will return. He has promised that he comes back as a thief. And I think all of us lock our doors at night, maybe during the day as well. And perhaps we have some added influence, maybe a pistol or something by the bed in case an intruder does break in. We, we like to be prepared to protect our stuff, things that are going to be burned up when this life is over. But are we prepared when the Lord returns? That's the most important question. Are we prepared for that great and terrible day? If we are, we can expect to receive our final reward, and that is heaven. If not, we have nothing else to expect except the fires of hell when this life is over. So if you have to remove sin by being restored, obeying what we typically call as a second law of pardon, please come as together we stand and sing, or if you need to be or if you need to put Christ on in baptism, please do so now as we stand and sing.